Tena koto, tena koto, tena tatu koto. Let us pray. We begin our prayers with some psalms from the Christian Bible. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The following verse is the basis of a hymn I sang at my Catholic confirmation ceremony in Melbourne many years ago. I have been a happy migrant to this beautiful city for over 18 years now, working as a registered psychologist. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness and faithfulness. On behalf of our Council, I pray that you find the common ground between you to lead our community with kindness and wise judgment, so that we may live in harmony and peace together. No matter how diverse our backgrounds, faiths, values and cultures. This is what we strive to demonstrate in our Interfaith Council. I leave you with the gift of a 2023 calendar from the New Zealand Religious Diversity Centre, which has the theme of light. Each month depicts a different faith with a picture and quote about the concept of light. This is relating to hope, knowledge and deep understanding. I pray that you will lead our community and shed light as per the February Baha'i prayer. No light can compare with the light of justice, the establishment of order in the world and the tranquility of the nations and us all depend upon it. Amine, na mihi nui noho ore mai ra. Thank you and take care of yourselves. Kia ora. Uh, public forum today. Uh, we have eight speakers for the public forum. So we have quite a bit to get through now. Uh, how are we going with the technical arrangements? Because they have one speaker who was due to speak on Zoom. Of course, that's quite. He's coming in person. Hey, yeah. So I see him. Excellent. So, Mr. Ford, you're first up. Welcome, Mr. Ford. You have five minutes to speak. Mayor, councillors, I wish to begin by congratulating those councillors who have been elected for the first time, including, as I see, Councillor Lucas, Councillor Mendy Mayhem, Councillor, sorry, I can't see you there, Gilbert, sorry, I can't see your name, Blake, and also those who have been, and also Councillor Weverall, greetings. And also congratulations to those who have been returned and also a second time round for Councillor Acklin. Nice to see you all. I want to begin today by talking on behalf of Disabled Persons Assembly about our feelings regarding the proposed George Street changes, sorry, the review of the George Street changes. Farmer's block on George Street, as I found it, and as have others, is way more accessible than previously. Personally, I absolutely love it, particularly with the fact that I can, as a wheelchair user, far more easily navigate it than I could the existing block. 
Personally, when I've been in town and had some time, I'd like to go back to the newly renovated part of George Street again and again. I just absolutely love it. It's a really good investment. Yes, there are teething issues, as far as I understand, has have been disclosed in the media. For example, the electronic sensor, which is supposed to pick up traffic, traffic coming in and out of George Street, isn't working properly. It's not properly aligned from what I heard. So that issue needs to be fixed. It, there are other issue, issues that will need to be fixed, but it doesn't need a full review to enable that to happen. That is my first argument. <coughs> oh, excuse me. It's ironic that those councillors who were saying that they favour a review are prepared to spend more money to have a review that actually just allow the work to be completed, the work to be done. Ultimately, if a review, if a wide-ranging review was decided upon by this council and putting the whole scope of the project within it, then that would mean that the costs of the project would be just would just increase over over and above what they already are. We budgeted for it. It's coming in on budget. It's doing really well. It's great to see that some councillors who were previously opposed to the reconstruction of George Street are now coming around to it. I so welcome that. It's absolutely fantastic that that change of heart is actually happening. Put simply, the improved access or accessibility of George Street is something that I and other disabled people cherish. We, as DPA, alongside other community organisations, have <laughs> fought so hard for this to happen. It would be a real shame if a review, if a full-scale review was conducted. I would like to see the George Street changes progress. Any changes that are needed, they don't need a review, they just simply need to be worked in as the work progresses, as the construction proceeds. Please don't undo the work, which has already been done by so many and will in time benefit so many. Mayor, I'm now able to take questions. Uh, so I have a couple of questions for Owen. Uh, because you have stated about the uh, money for the review versus the money to continue it, do you know how much money that would, a review would cost? I don't know, but, but... Do you know how much money will be required to continue the work down the rest of George Street? Well, I haven't got that to her head, to be honest. And, and do you know how much money to change it? That would be a very interesting question because that is the crux of the issue. Exactly. So I think they are part of the questions of the review. And uh, you also said that it was on budget. Uh, do you have any figures for that? No, not to head, but as I understand, I've read about it in the ADT. It, it looks to be progressing very well. Yes, well, it certainly progressed well, but we don't know about the budget yet. Anyway, I was just curious if you had any figures, insights on that. Um, and how, how many times have you visited? I've visited countless times now. I oh. was down there last week. Right. And did, just as a matter of fact, and I circulated that farmer's block a number of times. Excellent. How much money did you spend in the total times you've visited there? I've spent about $20, $30. And I, it, it, it's, it's, it will be a great retail area, and I think it will return economic benefits. I mean, I've read that in places such as Dublin and Ireland, where they trialled a partially pedestrianised or fully pedestrianised street, that the economic returns were actually quite good. And that, that was actually in the wake of COVID. They did that experiment in the wake of the first COVID outbreak and just when they relaxed the restrictions in that country from what I could remember reading. So therefore, it's really, really positive 
to have that. And I've been to other places like in Federal Street in Auckland and seen the, you know, the retail area there. It does a good trade. And in Christchurch, I haven't been there very much since the earthquakes, but even before that, they had a pedestrianised <coughs> street in Christchurch, excuse me. But I think at the same time, any pedestrianised area I've been in, I've seen lots of activity, lots of retail activity. It really flows back in the end. It's a good investment to make. It's also, most importantly, a good investment for our environment and also a good investment for social connection. It's not, it shouldn't just be seen in just purely economic terms. Excellent, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, uh, Mr. Ford, as ever, for your passion and um, succinct analysis. Um, I was just going to ask you if you're aware of the purple pound in the UK yes. that estimates that um, the spending power of disabled people is about £250 billion a year, and whether that, those sort of figures have implications for an improved area like George Street in terms of the benefits to retail. I think so, because there are, I'm working pretty much 30 hours a week, 35 hours a week, I've got money to spend, maybe not much, given that I work as a, for a long government aid organisation. But at the same time, it's, it's about, I think I've seen the figures for, I think the, globally, and I think it's around a trillion dollars. So let's just take an example of that. I see when I see a lot of cruise ships coming into town, there are a lot of disabled people, there are people who mobilise using wheelchairs, crutches, mo mobility walkers, scooters, and even there are permanent residents here of Dunedin who do the same and do spend. But those cruise ship passengers bring a lot of dollars to Dunedin. They, they spend on our main street. They, and I mean, the improved experience that I've encountered on the just the refurbished part of George Street gives me a lot of confidence that it will actually increase the ability of cruise ship passengers to easily navigate our retail space. Very quickly, thank you, Mr. Ford. Um, in practical terms, what is your journey? What is your journey like now compared with how it was before the changes? I'm able to just very easily cross the, without the guttering of old, I'm able to just easily cross the curb, mobility curb cuts. It's just brilliant I'm able to do that. I just feel so liberated. And if I may say so, I heard from CCS Disability Action yesterday that one person that I know who's a wheelchair user also was absolutely enraptured by what she had encountered. So I can say that it's not just me, but it's other disabled people. However we mobilise or move, who are really encountering a positive experience. I think that having inclusionary environments is good for everyone. It's good for everyone in our community. Let's not just think of the economic imperative, but as I say, the social imperative as well. Mia. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Very good. Next we have uh, Mr. David Bainbridge the Far. The floor is yours. You have five minutes. Sure. Kia ora Thanks for inviting me to talk today at Public Forum. It's nice to see many of you again. Um, I'm going to be talking today about free public buses. Now I'm not talking uh, on behalf of an organisation or a group. Um, I'm also not talking as a bus user. I don't use the bus, and if buses were free, I still wouldn't use the bus. But I do think my rates should go towards making buses free. I'm lucky enough to live close enough to my workplace to be able to walk to work, and I'm fit and able enough to be able to do that. I'm also privileged enough to be able to afford to own and run a car to drive to the supermarket or wherever else I want to go without worrying about can I afford to put petrol in it this week. But that's not a position everyone in Dunedin finds themselves in. And for many in Dunedin, buses are a real lifeline. And bus fares can be a real barrier to that lifeline. 
the cost of a bus fare can stop someone from attending a job interview or accepting a job offer if it means they have to take two buses to and from work every day. It can also be a barrier to attending a, a healthcare appointment. But ultimately, public transport is a public service. And public services, I think, should be free and funded by the ratepayer. Now, I've not been in this building for a long time. It's a public art gallery. It's free to come in, and I'm happy that my rates pay for it, even though I don't come here very often. Likewise, public toilets, public parks, they're all funded by the ratepayer, and they're all free to use, and they're all of great benefit to the city of Dunedin. The benefits of making buses free uh, are manifold, and in, in five minutes I don't think I have quite time to cover them all. Um, but I've written a letter to you, Mr. Mayor, and to all of the councillors recently, outlining, I think, the, the many benefits of making buses free. For me, as, like I say, someone who wouldn't use the bus, being able to drive, uh, you know, there'd be less traffic on the road. Parking is a common issue for council to consider. And there's two ways of dealing with the parking issue. You can try and increase supply or you can try and reduce demand. Increasing the supply of parking would be very costly, but reducing the demand, potentially, free public buses would be a really good way of reducing the demand on the car parking spaces in town. The other key benefit I just want to mention is climate change. Uh, next year, ORC is moving to electrify the bus fleet in Dunedin. And we need to do everything we can to reduce our emissions, and transport plays a huge role in that. So getting more people on the buses, I think, is, is imperative as we try and reach that 2030 net carbon zero goal. The cost to make buses free in Dunedin be around about $3 million a year. That's roughly how much they take in fares at the moment. The cost to run the buses is significantly more than that. Buses are already heavily subsidized. They're approximately 80, 90% subsidized already. Um, why not go the whole, whole way and make them fully subsidized, make them completely free? The, the benefits have been shown from other places around the world that have made buses completely free. And I'd like Council to consider um, putting that funding aside through the next long-term plan to fund free public buses in Dunedin. That $3 million or so be between a 1% and 2% rates increase. And a recent study in Auckland showed that there's strong public support for this. Uh, nearly 70% of people voted in favour in this uh, study that I think the PSA carried out for buses to be completely free. As I say, I've written you all a letter that uh, I think covers more of the benefits, but I'm, I'm happy to take any questions you have this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Dave. It's unusual seeing you there in this position. Um, um, as someone who's actually been considering the same thing myself, um, and it's interesting you came up with the three to four million because that's sort of what the back of the envelope calculation says. Do you know anything about um, Wakakatahi's, the relationship with Wakakatahi and taking a fear and getting fear box recovery? Because that's actually still an unknown for me as well. Do you, if we drop the fear to zero, do you know what's going to happen to fear box recovery? I don't know. Yeah, okay. Um, and I guess along the other one then, would you like to see this considered something for like the 10 year plan? Yes. Cool. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Bainbridge Savar. Also, very strange seeing you sitting there. <laughs> um, two questions from me. Are you going to are you going to give the same um, talk to the ORC? Correct. Yeah, I'm talking at the public forum of ORC next week. Great. And second point for me, we can all pluck um, data and evidence out of the air. But from what I've read from around Europe, the biggest lever, uh, would you agree that the biggest lever to get people to move onto public transport port is actually been found to be reliability rather than, that, rather than price levers? But, I mean, potentially. One, one of the studies I found really interesting was a town in Belgium, I think, and I mentioned it in the letter, where yep. the, the service is still, I think, two, two buses an hour. So they didn't increase the number of buses or improve the service, really but they saw a huge uptake, over a 1,000% increase in people using it just by making it free. And car use, car ownership stayed the same. People just left their cars on their driveway more often and took the bus when they could. Okay. Um, 
probably that would you would you agree? I'm thinking of questions. Would you agree that it's probably a good idea when you speak to the ORT, ORC to get encourage them not only in price but also their frequency and reliability to maybe have two levers potentially? Than one? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're done with questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Sue Novell. Welcome, Ms. Novell. The next five minutes are all yours. Thank you, Aura. I'm a member of Senior Climate Action Network, and our focus has shifted from raising awareness about climate change to the immediate challenges of addressing underlying causes and to local responses. Climate change and the underlying cause of overshooting of planetary limits are the biggest threat to the future well-being of all communities, including Dunedin. We are here to support the Council's ongoing efforts in addressing these issues. We encourage the Council to continue to prioritise environmental and community health and resilience and to engage with the community in this vital work. As a new council, you are in, at a critical stage in sorting out your priorities and strategies, planning and budgeting, all this with finite and limited resources. We'd like to encourage you to recognise the work that is going on in and outside of DCC around environmental and sustainability issues. We know and have engaged with council employees and agencies that are involved in this work, including the City Portrait, the Zero Emissions Group, the Healthy Food for All Plan, Coastal Erosion Plans, and many more DCC initiatives. These indicate that DCC is well on the way to grappling with the major issues that we face in environmentally and socially in building a vibrant and resilient city. This critical work needs, though, visibility, coherence, and community engagement. Visibility includes enabling, supporting, leading, and connecting various groups, agencies, and individuals. It means engaging with communities that participate in decision-making processes. We believe it is imperative that DCC looks beyond the here and now and works toward shared collective well-being. We ask that the Council's emphasis and support of economic and business activities is primarily the delivery of enough of the basics that people need so that our city can thrive collectively. The basics are healthy biodiversity, clean water and air, and enough food for all. Coupled with this support for and provision of adequate shelter, housing, good health, social connections and equity. Besides protecting and growing biodiverse natural spaces, we urge the DCC to invest in local small scale sustainable activities like agroforestry farming, regenerative growing of grains, fruits, seeds and vegetables, flour mills, bakeries, leather, cloth, cheese and basket making, potteries, wooden, woolen mills, passive house building, etc. The Council should encourage and support community-led models where producers, vendors and consumers cooperate. We recognise that you cannot be all things to all people, but supporting these local activities can help achieve the major initiatives and goals in your plan, we believe. The DCC and various community groups will need to plan and act together effectively. We ask you to prioritise setting up a physical hub or site to connect key resilience builders, including DCC staff working in this area, and facilitating public forums to connect and work together on our dilemmas. This will enhance and progress the vital work towards local resilience the DCC already has underway. In conclusion, we know and you know, we are living through a time of rapid and complex change 
with unique challenges. Hence our plea to consider a significant shift in priorities that are coherent around sustainability and resilience. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. We have a question from uh, Deputy Mayor Barker. Kia ora. So for a couple of questions, last year you gifted Council um, a plan for climate change action during the LTP. How's, how's that, that progressed for you? We have been talking with different groups in DCC and that's been very enlightening because there you have a very um, dedicated young people working in this space and we were very impressed and they what they need is, is there's a group here, a group here, they need to be come together and work together to create one coherent plan. And I'm really interested in what you're talking about, a, a physical hub. Could you tell me a, a little bit more about what you might imagine that that would look like? At present, there are so many different groups working in Dunedin in this space, and we do not know what each other is doing. We don't know if we're duplicating things. It would be wonderful to have some sort of place, even a physical place, to have um, maybe run by the DCC, with DCC and these groups together so that we can coordinate. Because once you have these, um, your groups working, you will have a plan and you'll need to have visibility, you'll need to have the community coming on board you can have a space where you could highlight different activities um, and um, yeah, get together and just actually carry on doing the work that you need to do. Thank you for the work that you do. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Councillor Walker. Yep, thank you. Sorry to hog the questions. Uh, thank you for coming along. Um, so two, two questions. So you, I've, I think from what I hear you saying, you're probably aware uh, that we're in the process of stitching in city portrait thriving, um, th city portrait thriving cities, in essence, uh, donut economics into our strategic framework. So my understanding is you'd like to, to be assured that the community would be part of that process? First question. We definitely do. It is the basis of a healthy community to have that going. It needs to, it's, it's, it needs to ca carry on, yes. Cool. And some of your basics you listed would be part of that, that donut. So the second question goes to the Deputy Mayor's question around the physical site. Um, would you be, are you going to be in the position to come to either, well, probably ideally long-term plan with some firmer ideas around that so that we would have some idea of what we need to do to make that happen? Definitely, it would be great to be able to work together on this, yes. Thank you, Councillor Gilbert. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, a very quick question. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm also intrigued by this hub that you're talking about. Uh, would it be fair to say that there would be potential for educational elements to it? Is that also in what you're thinking? That would be really, really good because you will need this. You will need to have people working together with the public, and you, you can, you could, you could. Um, highlight your activities, you could have talks, you could have, you could, media events um, could all spring from this. I would also very much like um, Councillor Walker be intrigued to, to see something a little more um, in depth on this uh, and particularly do you have any idea as to whether there might be any tourism elements or whether it feeds into any of the cruise ships or, or whatever? I could see you've got the eyesight down there. If you had that, a hub like this, say next door, it would really open up people's eyes to what Dunedin is and what it's doing and what it wants to do. And it would be a very positive step to have that visibility of sustainability and resilience um, plans of Dunedin on show. Awesome, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, we only have 30 minutes allocated for public forum, uh, so I move that Council extends the public forum beyond 30 minutes, seconded by uh, Councillor Walker. Uh, all those in favour say aye. Aye. So, so carried. 
And now I'd like to ask Ms. Jennifer Scott. Thank you, Ms. Yes, uh, the next five minutes are all yours. I am sure that all our vision for Dunedin is to have fresh, clean and natural drinking water. One part of this vision should be for the DCC councillors and ratepayers of Otago to regularly revisit and question the use of fluoride being added to our drinking water supply. When we review the use of fluoride, our online searching leads to a plethora of research that is pointing in one direction. The addition of fluoride to town and city water supplies shows more risks than benefit and is detrimental to one's health. I have two examples. I will read one of them. In a review called Developmental Fluoride Neurotoxicity, an updated review published in 2019 at University of Chicago, Journal of Political Economy, it highlights, first, topical fluoride application in the oral cavity appears to be a more direct and appropriate means of preventing cavities. Second, ingested fluoride is suspected of causing adverse effects, in particular, neurotoxicity during early development. Plus, within the brain, fluoride appears to accumulate in regions responsible for memory and learning. Of course, here pops in the loosely justified claim that are we, we are doing this to stop cavities. If fluoride prevents cavities, then using fluoridated toothpaste should do the same and of course not consuming unhealthy sugar-laden food and drinks. In addition, only a very small percentage of fluoridated water will actually touch people's teeth when swallowed. This fluoridated water is consumed by people internally and is used for cleaning, showering, watering gardens, and then ends up downstream. So where does the fluoride added to our water supply come from? Looking to the supply chain, we are shown that it is a toxic, polluting waste substance, which is sold to cities for large scale industries to get rid of its waste product. This polluting waste product is not naturally occurring and is a combination of both hexafluorosicilic acid, also known as hydrofluorosicilic acid, with labels reading toxic, do not take internally. It is highly corrosive. The other, sodium silicofluoride, which is toxic by inhalation, in contact with skin, and if swallowed. More about these chemicals and additional information can be found on the website Fluoride Free New Zealand. So where do these chemicals come from, you may ask? Large industrial and mining companies need to separate fluoride, which contaminates the initial substance they are after. For this, they may use sulfuric acid in the separation process. This in turn causes the fluoride to vaporise, creating highly toxic gaseous compounds called hydrogen fluoride and silicon tetrafluoride. The toxic fluoride chemicals used to be released directly from the smelters of mines. However, this causes significant damage to the surrounding environment by it being exposed to the poisonous gases, leading to fluoride poisoning. In order to stop this, now the toxic fluoride chemical vapours may be collected, then repackaged in large industrial drums, and then sold to cities who dump it into their own water supply. This is called water fluoridation. If this wasn't put into our water supply, this would have to be disposed of as a hazardous waste product. The companies who produce this would be paying significant fees in order to get rid of it. So here is the inconvenient truth. This act of dumping hazardous waste into a water supply would be by some called mass medicalisation and or poisoning. Would individuals still be keen on consuming it if they knew it was a poisonous, polluting waste product? So my question is, should it not be up to individuals within their own homes to decide if a toxic waste substance should be added into their drinking water? 
The amount of money spent towards the purchase and distribution of the waste product fluoride could be better spent subsidising household rainwater tanks. This will not only allow residents to feel more self-reliant, but will also lessen the demand on our city water supply. In our vision, by removing toxic waste products and providing subsidised rainwater tanks, we will be well on the way to a more intelligent, sustainable and environmentally friendly future for all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Scott. That's well timed. We appear to have no questions, so thank you very much. Oh, no questions. Uh, next we have uh, Ms Linda Buxton. Buxton. That again. So I work for the Cancer Society and my name is Linda. So councils are in a unique position to implement strategies that enable people to live healthy, active lifestyles. For instance, we acknowledge that this council puts people before tobacco industry profits by supporting smoke-free environments. Today, however, I'm focusing on a different harm and a different cancer. The harm is excessive UV radiation and the cancer is skin cancer, our most common cancer. And the reason for focusing on this is because the DCC is about to uh, invest in our destination play spaces. Shade is an important infrastructure issue if we want to turn the tide on skin cancer. Sure, people need to take responsibility and slip, slop, slap, wrap. But slipping into shade is only an option if some shade is available. We are not suggesting that everything is covered but we are asking that some built shade is planned for and that it is specifically funded in the plan for our destination play spaces. Aotearoa has the highest death rate from melanoma in the world and along with Australia, the highest incidence, yet skin cancer is highly preventable. Over 90% of skin cancer is caused by too much sun. We do need some sun. Um, here in the Southern District, we have higher rates of melanoma than many other districts. In fact, the age standardised rate per 100,000 in 2019 was the second highest in the country. Destination playgrounds have high patronage and that's why they're a great place to invest in some high quality shade. Sunburn at any age increases the risk of melanoma, but sunburn is particularly risky during childhood. The more sunburns, the greater the risk. Our UV environment from September through to the end of March is usually high enough to cause damage to people with fair skin in Dunedin. UV radiation peaks in January. We know this because NIWA have provided 10 years of UV index data. So the UV index is a measure of the intensity of UV radiation and the larger the number, the more intense the UV. I have included this map um, with information for each of you that will be handed out. The World Health Organization recommends sun protection when the UVI is three or above. Now the maps show that in Dunedin we have about three months when the UVI is six or above. And I can tell you that on average we have 57 days at or above 8, uh, when a handful of the UVI is also above 11. So UV radiation increases um, the closer you get to the equator. Now other councils are a little ahead of this great little city in terms of shade uh, provision, partly because, well, let's face it, we don't particularly need shade to cool us down. But please remember, unlike sunlight and heat, we cannot see or feel UV radiation. Heat and UV are two completely different things. That's why on a cool or cloudy day in Dunedin, we can still get sunburn. Appropriate shade and autiputi will make the outdoor space comfortable to use in all seasons. It may even extend the use of play equipment beyond summer months by providing shelter from rain. It can be aesthetically pleasing as an equitable form of sun protection and will provide protection for generations to come. Strategically planted trees can also be a good option, but it's usually a combination of a little bit of built and natural shade that's required. So good quality shade has the potential to significantly reduce our UV exposure. We don't think that the public should have to choose between shade and play equipment in a country with the highest rates of skin cancer in the world. Modern cities provide some shade for people to use, to choose to use. Many of our schools in the city are sun smart and many people look after their kids with some protection. And if we could have a little bit of shade strategically placed where children congregate, we will reduce overall UV exposure. UV damage builds up over our lifetime and the damage we do in childhood remains with us. It changes our DNA. 
It causes about 90,000 keratinocytic uh, skin cancers in addition to melanomas every year in this country, and they all require treatment. Melanoma is an aggressive cancer and it kills twice as many men as women. But together with the DCC playing their part, we can turn the tide on skin cancer. I'll leave you just with two examples. Marlborough District Council are aiming to have 85% of new playground and playground renewals to have shade included in the design. And Ashburton Domain Playground, where there was lots of mention of shade structures. However, it was noted that some of what was proposed in the plan wouldn't provide good quality shade in the playground. It was similar to those at Margaret Mayhe, which actually aren't very good. Which is why it was pleasing to see in the Ashburton Domain concept plan, built shade, the overhead canopy structure would provide north facing sheltered and shade for people uh, in a space for multi-purpose use. Finally, we're going to provide each of you with a new sun hat um, to go with the information mentioned. I will be emailing you two very short clips. One is the latest Australian campaign. They spend millions on their prevention campaigns about UVR. And the other is a two minute clip, uh, one of our Dunedin oncologists. Um, he's interviewing a, one of our old, old boys, uh, Mike Hessen, who many of you will um, know used to coach New Zealand cricket and it's a personal account and it just shows you the devastation uh, cancer diagnosis will cause. Sorry. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Yes, Councillor Lucas. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for your presentation. You mentioned at the beginning about um, you weren't suggesting all of our playgrounds be covered. Um, so what areas would you see as a priority? I mean, if you say the Mosgill playground is an example where they've got the, um, like the toddler area, would you see that as more of a priority or? I sure, mean, those, those areas are good. Uh, Mosgill is actually quite good. It's got a lot of trees. Um, I'm really thinking of, I've got an overhead view of the dinosaur park and um, there's really not much shade there and it would be good to just introduce some shade. Look, I know there's not a lot of money, um, so it's really about strategically placing it over one piece of, um, you know, high use equipment. That's why the destination playgrounds are really good to invest in because they have high use, so it will get a maximum impact. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I have two questions. My first question is, did you give feedback to the destination play spaces stuff that was out recently? We've provided feedback on all of your small okay. playground mm -hmm. upgrades and I tell you, I was really disappointed. I mean, that council does lots of fantastic work, so let's keep that in context. The uh, skate parks, teenagers have the worst sun protection. I would have loved just one piece of um, shade over one of the seating where kids do congregate. We know that teenagers use shade when it's built and as an example around the country and I'm really happy to provide those examples. So we're not asking for heaps and heaps, just us an, an amount, yeah. My next question is around what does good quality shade look like? You've mentioned trees and I know that some playgrounds put up shade sales, et cetera, et cetera, but what does, okay. if, if, if when, when it comes to council and we're assessing it, what should we be looking for? Yeah, I am confident that your staff will do their work and know what good quality shade is, but it needs to extend um, beyond the play equipment because more than half of the UV we get is indirect UV. So if you have really tiny um, shade sales, and I'll, I'll sort of give you the example, when you go to the beach and you have a little sun umbrella, if it's when the sun is directly overhead at peak UV, you'll get a tiny, you will get some um, protection, but for the rest of the time, most of it comes in from the side. So it needs to be a good size, pushed together, and in terms of trees, we like at least three trees planted together that have good canopy. So we'd prefer to plant, for instance, Pahutakawa rather than Lancewoods for obvious reasons. Um, so it's just making some really sensible decisions. Um, use the existing shade that's there um, from trees and maybe put one or two of your seating in, sh in shade. Doesn't all have to be there, not everyone will want, want it. Okay, thank you. Uh, still more, oh, yeah. Councillor Walker. Yeah, thank you, Ms Buxton. Um, this question may be to the CEO of the staff. I'm assuming that obviously the destination play spaces work will be informed by the consultation that's come in from the public. So there's no reason why that this request can't be request if, if progressed if that's part of what, what what is feeding through? I can't answer that until I've seen, I haven't seen the submissions yeah. on the destination plan. The, you, the, you've no. got three rounds of submissions, yeah. you've only just started. It's um, ongoing. Yeah. yeah, so it's ongoing. Yeah. I would just say that you guys did do a questionnaire and ask people about shade versus play equipment. If you look at that question and put it through people who know how to ask questions, you'll see that it, it really um, made people want to say you need play equipment. They put all the cost of shade in and said that we wanted everything covered. Um, so it wasn't really a great reflection. There's lots of examples where the public have said they would like some shade. 
Yeah. Um, and one more question from myself. Uh, by the by skate park, do you mean the one in Wharf Street? There's the there's a skate park, um, the, the one in Mo Mornington, is it? Mornington? Yeah, the one. Mornington one. It would be good to have a little bit, a tiny bit of shade put in up Because there. there are a few, but I was just yeah. wondering which one you were thinking of when you that, made the statement. Yeah, I submitted on that one, so that's why I'm remembering it. I mean, it's, we really appreciate that you're investing and keeping kids active and giving them lots of opportunities to stay active. Great. Thank okay. you. Oh, hang on. One more, one more question. Sorry, one more from me. And this is one occasion where I'm exceptionally happy that uh, Dunedin isn't first. Uh, you said we were second, we had the second highest levels. Who does have first? I'm just trying to figure out whether it's that they're further south, further north, something that they're it's, doing. Um, no, well, I mean, it, we, this, they're way out. Taranaki are way out ahead. And then we and the west coast and another area are all, we did top them, but um, we're all kind of about the same. But we're always over halfway above. And it's because we don't have the hot temperatures, so people mm. don't think about it. We also have four seasons in a day. We also have a population with a lot of fair skin, so, yeah. And, and probably a population that's ageing, so all those things. Um, I mean, they were age standardised rates, but our hospitals are full of people with melanoma. Mm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have uh, Dr. Bridie Loney. Kia ora, that's on. Um, kia ora ko Bridi Loni Aho, no o te poti aho, ngā mihi o te ata, your worship the mayor and councillors. Um, I've been invited to to give you some information, so um, I'll continue. I speak to you as a recent head of the Dunedin School of Art in a line that goes back 150 years as the art school moved and changed with the time. So I'm an emeritus member of Otago Polytechnic. With the incorporation of the different polytechnics into a single entity, there is a possibility that Te Pukinga may decide that there should only be one polytechnic art offering in Te Waipunamu, the South Island, and staff are deeply concerned that the art school that has served the city so well for so long may not survive, or if it does, may be so diminished that it will scarcely deserve to be called an art school. I have been asked to alert you as stakeholders to this possibility and therefore also to ask you to consider what the art school means to you and to prepare a response should this be needed. And I want to say it may not be needed. I've been asked to give you some prior information and a heads up. So the Dunedin School of Art was incorporated into Otago Polytechnic in 1966 who have supported it consistently, improving buildings, enabling new qualifications and providing plant and equipment for eight studio areas. It offers diploma, degree and postgraduate programs but retains a grip on the craft arts that were its initial focus. We have a new ceramics facility and professional sculpture, printmaking, jewellery, textiles and photography facilities along with a strong painting section. Our graduates exhibit and sell their work locally, nationally and internationally, but are also to be found in many other vocations as the education they receive offers a myriad of transferable skills. And I know two graduates are in this room, at least. Um, we are a significant part of the city's vibrant arts and culture sector and our present presence indicates the city's commitment to art, both in its making and its reception as a vital and centering aspect of human behaviour. We can see the strength of our Naitahu graduates as they contribute to the city's infrastructure in the mahi of Paimanu's engagement with the Dunedin Public Art Gallery collections and in the many funded art projects supported by the Dunedin City Council. Most of the secondary school art teachers in this region are our graduates. Graduates working on Enviro schools and art science projects with the University of Otago and Otago Museum enrich our understanding of the sciences. We are much more broadly based and more broadly effective than people tend to think when they think of art as something within a frame that is a decoration in your living room. So the arts have penetrated the education sector. 
um, the art school also sits with strong schools in design and architecture at the Polytechnic, which increases their position as mutually reinforcing the strength of the arts sector here. Now some background, why is Te Pukenga interested in reforms? Thirty years ago, only about half a dozen cities and regional centres in total offered tertiary art programs. There were something like five to seven art programs in the, in the 1990s. But with the implementation of student fees, increased competitiveness, um, the encouragement of regional delivery and a new focus on the creative industries, by 2000, each regional centre, including Omaru, Greymouth, right up the country, had at least one art school and there were about 24 at one point when I counted across a country with the population of Sydney with seven art schools. Of the 24, seven as well as Wananga programs were in Te Waipanamu and all were stretched. Um, therefore, some rationalisation makes sense. This is not an argument against Te Pukinga's principles. But we want to retain our art school, so it was everyone else. Bonganui fought very hard for theirs, which was eventually amalgamated into Palmerston North. Christchurch already has an art school at the University of Canterbury, which is not within Te Pukenga's mandate. So it would make sense that if Te Pukenga have only one art school in the South Island, it should be in Otipoti, Dunedin. But even in this case, with Te Pukenga's concern, how am I going? Oh, it may be a reduced offering with a focus on pre-degree programs. This would reduce the capacity to develop pro professional artists to a highly technically skilled. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, Bridie, thank you for coming uh, to talk to us today. Um, What's the timing, do you think? I mean, you've asked us to be alert. You've, you've asked us to be alert to uh, make a submission, if that's appropriate at the time. But what kind of timing are you thinking this is going to, when this is going to go down? I think does? possibly after March, after the end of the financial year, Te Pukenga, who's focusing at the moment on the upper levels, will start to address the delivery of programmes. They've been remarkably slow. I mean, we've been sitting with vague threats for about three years now, um, but life goes on, which is in fact also very stressful. But I would say after the end of the financial year. Thank you, and my subsequent question would be, um, who will, how will we know? How will we know uh, that this is about to happen and we should, as stakeholders, uh, give our view? We will alert you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned um, that this has been going on for a long time. What impact does that have on the staff and their wellbeing? The staff are very concerned. They're, and uh, because of the ongoing problem with competition and the number of students dispersed across the school, all art schools have been under stress. Um, because they're squeezed to deliver what they can with a diminishing number of students because th there should be some rationalisation. There should be fewer art schools, but don't take ours away. So the staff, are, this, this, this pressure has increased, a continued pressure for the last 15 years. Right now they're very anxious. For, to, to put, obviously talk about our art school, well, over the years, given you were the head of that school for a long time, would you say our reputation is, is sought after and people come from outside Otipoti Dunedin to come to the school because of its reputation? I think about 40% come from outside and they come for all sorts of reasons. They come for the student life. They also come for the workshops. We have a very strong ceramics section which actually primarily offers two-year diploma programs. Now that's what Te Pukinga wants to deliver. It wants to deliver skills. We also add to that degree and postgraduate programs. So they come to us to extend the skills they have. 
I mean, it can be played in different ways. We can agree with Te Puka, that, for Te Pukinga, that we will reinforce the delivery of skills and actually increase. We don't have a diploma in jewellery. It would be very sensible to have it. I'm, not, I'm no longer a member of the school. I'm an emeritus, OK? <laughs> I'm not writing their policy. But it would be very sensible to say, extend an arm to Te Puka and say, yeah, sure, let us help our diploma and skill-based delivery but let us keep our, post our degree and postgraduate programs because they grow off those. Do you, do you understand? Yeah. So, I mean, a branch, a handout, and you know. <laughs> uh, Thank I you. also have a question. Uh, do you have a art school preservation action plan? Um, we're building a strategy, which is what you're saying, and we have different groups who are involved in, like the a foundation group. Um, this group within the school, we're building one, um, but it needs to be reinforced. Thank you. Uh, sorry, what do you mean by reinforced? Uh, it needs external support from you are our stakeholders, you know, and I think the issue of who are the stakeholders for something as broad as an art school isn't quite understood. Um, because we've been here for 153 years, people take the art school for granted and assume it will go on. So actually, uh, we, we need, we, I'm asking you as stakeholders to think about what the art school means to you and help us with that strategic direction. Okay, thank you. That's great. Next we have Mr Lindsay Moyer. Morning to you all. Excuse me, couldn't you push the button? Yes, there we go. Thank Morning you. to you all and the public gallery. I'm Lindsay Moyer and I'm a concerned citizen and here to present my opinion on the condition of our roading network and our participation in LGNZ. I have and will continue to ring the general number within council to notify the person who answers the phone of a particular section of our roading network in disrepair or a specific pothole or the deterioration of a surface. At times I may mention more than one area of concern. To pinpoint the exact spot is not so easy. I must be fully attentive while driving, so this process takes a minimum of two volunteers to either stop, start or drive slowly, repeatedly over sections of our beautiful city to note these exact locations which then can be passed singularly to the DCC operator. Over time we have a succession of administrators steer our council away from in-house utility maintenance to contractor based. To counter this statement of mine, you may say this has made the process more affordable, amongst other reasons of excuse. However, this also has led to much less accountability within the upper echelons of such. Our dabble into this top-heavy corporate world for quite some time now has proved how easily corrupt this world of high finance can become. We all know how the books were manipulated to help convince the voters for investment in the stadium. My point here is I am now involved at some emotional level to state the bleeding obvious. The condition of our roading network is treacherous in many areas, dodging, weaving and watching vigilantly for the next crater in front. The safety protrusions around schools, speed restriction and ends of such with LED combined signage reduce more parking, particularly George Street Normal School, where each park less creates an unsafe, hastily double park for the occupant nearby. Some in town have been placed on footpaths, adequately visible, so why not all, if these are deemed necessary. Our orange road cones have made a mockery of safety extreme. Who on earth governs this blatant, hideous overkill of our world turned orange? And I'm not even mentioning the state highway conditions. These are our local streets. 
We now know some of what I've discussed has gradually been influenced by LGNZ, of which Council pays an amount unknown by me, and yet I contribute the same as I help pay your salary. I want you folk to cancel our connection with LGNZ, which is coerced by central government to introduce a number of initiatives, the Three Waters being one of such, amongst others which we do not need or want. This Three Waters in particular will strip this council area, myself included, of our huge asset base involved over a broad area to be included and governed from out of town. The pittance we would be paid for this asset would be borrowed money, we're told, of which we would pay out of our general tax take. Lunacy in the extreme, accountability unknown, but certainly farther out of town than this office would normally provide. I love this city and what it provides mostly, and I want to help make it particularly possible for our existing residents to enjoy such also. And there's a leak on the spouting as I walked along, just right in front of the town hall actually. Stop this connection with LGNZ. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Moore. We appear to have no questions. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Mary O'Brien. Welcome, Ms. O'Brien. The next three, five minutes are all yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, um, Your Worship and Councillors. I would um, just like to thank the Council for this opportunity to appear today, and in particular, during the past consultation time, I would like to thank the Councillors um, who have interrupted their busy schedule to meet with us, and also the Council staff who have ensured that the consultation process around George Street has been accessible and has resulted in a um, accessible planning and design process. I'm the Access Coordinator at CCS Disability Action and across New Zealand we support a, over 5,500 people. Oh, thank you. Um, and we also provide significant advocacy for disabled people. We are really pleased to report that we have received positive feedback regarding the farmer's block. It is a marked contrast from the high volume of reports that we received from people who could not access or, or felt unsafe in George Street. I'm just going to quickly outline some of the key but very practical factors that make George Street accessible. The farmer's block is welcoming. Internationally, this is guarded as a key uh, success factor for sh shared spaces. The presence of, of accessible mobility parks will allow people to access the CBD. The level service allows people to walk comfortably without pain or fear of slip trips and falls. The level service along with the narrow carriageway creates a similar and safer crossing distance and people can choose where to cross. I have seen examples of this already and in particular um, a wheelchair using crossing at the centre of the block that was would be unheard of before. The tiles delineating the carriageway, building frontages and strongly textured pathway provide guidance for people who are blind or who have low vision. There's room for cafe tables, shade and place to sit and rest. These create a more attractive environment and allow people to extend their time in George Street. Dunedin now has a stunning location for events such as pipe band championships, ID fashion events, etc. These are only some of the inclusive fe features of a farmer's block and I invite you all to compare these features with the rest of George Street as you go about your daily business. Disabled people and their families represent about 53% of consumers. 
So when that we consider that 26% of the Otago population has a disability, this represents about half the population who would like to access George Street. The proportion of disabled consumers will increase as the population ages. 56% of the New Zealand population over the age of 65 has a disability. This includes groups such as baby boomers who are keen to get out there, enjoy life and um, spend their savings. A tangible example of this is the predicted increase in mobility park permit holders in the city. In 2018, 4,500 Dunedin City residents held a mobility parking permit. It is estimated that this will increase to 6,500 in 2023. There is little New Zealand evidence regarding con the consumer spending of disabled people. However, in the UK, the Purple Pound, which has already been discussed today, estimates that 75% of UK disabled people and their families have walked away from a business because of poor accessibility or service. By not being accessible, it is estimated in the UK that high street shops miss out on about 276 million pounds a month, and restaurants, clubs and pubs will miss out on 163 million pounds a month. At 1.3 billion people globally, disabled people represent more than one in four of the planet, a market larger than China. In addition to this, Barclays Bank states that no business can afford to ignore the 12 billion disabled people contribute to the tourism industry and its guidance to consumers states that where everyone is welcome, everything is possible. New Zealand evidence regarding community exclusion indicates that the potential loss to the business sector by excluding disabled customers is similar. Analysis of some New Zealand shared streets, spaces, demonstrate increased participation. Fort Street is a network of um, shared spaces of Queen Street in Dunedin. Um, following the upgrade there, there was a 54% in pedestrian volumes and a 47% increase in consumer spending. Jellicoe Street in the Winyard Quarter also reported 129% increase in pedestrian activity and a 69% in cycle volume and a 57% increase in bus ridership. I'm sure many of you have visited. How are we going? A bit over. Eh? Can I have one minute? <laughs> um, we think the farmer's block is attractive and accessible and it is a success. To review it for a second time or make significant changes would be a retrograde step, an unwise expenditure which would result in the exclusion of a significant group of people who contribute to the economy and the life of the city. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you um, for that, Mary, and that extensive report. Um, could you just give us a little bit of a sample of the feedback that people gave you? Do you have any sort of quotes Certainly, from people just to you. get the range of, of mm. um, experiences? I think the most stunning one was absolute utter joy when um, a woman phoned me who has often reported to me about the difficulties that she has um, accessing George Street. And... I said, what can you do that you can't do before? And the answer to that from that person was everything. I've also observed in just short strips, trips down George Street, more people, um, just more people around. As I've already mentioned, a person in a wheelchair propelling himself across George Street, that's just totally unheard of. And that probably you think, oh, well, that's OK, so what? But the fact is that often for, um, for example, wheelchair users and anybody who's um, not well, energy is a key contributor to where they choose to go for the journey. And the other indicator is safety, and that's for all pedestrians. If people don't feel safe, they won't go there. And that even applies to people who um, 
whether or not they choose to walk to the bus stop or use active transport. So whilst this is quite a um, s small view, it extends further. I also witnessed a gentleman um, on the same trip to town alighting f in the mobility car park from his, his he'd driven himself to town, getting out of the car, and it was right down the end of the block long before I was. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Melly. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, thanks for the presentation. Actually, it's a sign of kind of a side question, but it's not irrelevant. The Knox block currently is being worked on at the moment. <coughs> um, in terms of wheelchair users and curb shape, um, I'm not clear on what's going in there at the moment, so I might be able to get some clarity later, but would you pursue, I would assume a wheelchair user would prefer to see a dish curb put in there uh, so that they could cross at any point up and down that block rather than traditional curbs going back into that? Oh, we would definitely prefer not to see traditional curbs. They are a pure, uh, um, a significant obstacle. With regards to the technicality of that, I would not provide advice on that. But oh, I yeah, the, the dish curb is basically exists. what's at the bottom of the octagon yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Right, Councillor Walker. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brown, for coming in, and thank you for giving me your time uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm going to be very careful here because I don't want to misquote Mr. Ford, but I think he said he felt liberated. Um, is that a sentiment that you're hearing from? Oh, totally. Absolutely. Um, and it's not only here, but that's, that's common feedback across the country and across New Zealand when a well-planned and well-designed shared space is is developed. You know, it's pretty liberating to be able to make it. It's about choice and control in inaccessible communities, totally reduce choice and control for people. Thank you. Councillor Witherall. Uh, thank you, Mary and Mr. Ford. Um, I've enjoyed listening to your recommendations and that you really like George Street. As a, as a stakeholder, uh, I've been somewhat criticised over uh, the, the, the design of George Street. And um, I'm wanting to make the city uh, welcoming for all. I do believe you can also paint the worst house in the best street and people will say it will look good. However, it needs to function as well. Are you happier with the, uh, the uh, width of the, the footpath? Is that a main thing, or the removing of curbing? Is that, is that what you really like the most, or the planting? I, I go back to the design of it. Um, I've been witness to three able-bodied people falling over in the last 10 days over the same obstacle. Um, so I think, the, unfortunately, there are things that need to be tweaked, and I think that's a, it's a good thing. But when it comes to the, the design, the width of the footpath, is that a main concern to you? Um, as with everything else, it isn't one particular feature that makes a success of anything, and it's a combination of all of those things, particularly the space and it's space for people. People actually just want to thrive and have a good life. And when we've got that room for people to come in and move around, some of the images that we've seen on the George Street newsletter show a lot of people moving about. Obviously, um, with everything, there are going to be the odd um, hiccup or teething problem, but they, are, they can be managed and they're um, not, not significant. Yeah. I think it's also a place of beauty now. I was beginning to think when I walked down George Street that it actually looked a bit embarrassing in comparison to other places that you go. So it's this whole thing about creating an attractive environment where you see lots and lots of varied people and they feel safe and are enjoying themselves. And I think that in those first weeks we've got that evidence in George Street. I personally am not in favour of people crossing the street mid-block when traffic is involved. Um, however, there's also uh, um, uh, um, a question in regards to um, mobility car parks. We mm -hmm. have two mobility car parks on the both, but on the same side of the road. Would you like to see them on other, both sides of the road, opposed to one side of the road? I had a comment from a lady the other day in regards to, um, she has a handicapped daughter and she, who doesn't drive, she brings her into town. 
Um, would you like to see that risk taken out by having a mobility park on the other side of the road? I, I understand that that's in the plan, um, so that there'll be some on either side of the road. So mm -hmm. then it makes depends on the makeup of the of the people in the car. If the driver's disabled, then they can get out on the on right. the side. If it's the passenger, then they can park on the other side and get out. The other factors that make it more accessible and safer for people using those parks are just the general room and the width and the slow movement of the traffic. So people are able to see and predict, and you can also predict when the light's going to go red and then a light from the car. Um, with regards to mid-block crossing, um, pedestrians have priority in um, shared spaces. And to be honest, that's a bit of an individual decision. Some people would never dream of it and would go to the lights. Others who are um, conserving their energy and those sorts of things. And it's a really, really important thing to note that in New Zealand um, we have a significant body of research around community exclusion of disabled people. And a key finding is that, particularly in relation to footpaths, disabled people make less trips and they often have to make longer and more taxing and arduous trips simply because of the setup of the footpath which is obviously not we've not gotten farms blocks and this isn't just an inconvenience it has a long-term impact on their mental health and physical health so yeah it's a big deal thank so you so much thank you i think we, <laughs> yeah. that's that's quite enough thank you we're uh, well past our five minutes but thank you very much Ms. o'brien thank you very much for the opportunity to be here it's been right nice now uh, that is the end of public forum thank you very much and uh, at this stage, we'll move on to the council meeting proper. I have... Deputy Chair of Keep New Zealand Beautiful. I've mentioned it a couple of times, but it's not on there, sorry. I'm happy to take questions, Mr. Mayor. Do we have any questions? <coughs> we have no questions. I now move the resolution, the resolution that Council notes the open and completed actions from resolutions of Council meetings as attached. Is there a second vote? Thank you, Council Mayor. Anyone want to speak to that motion? No. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Again. Carried. Move to item seven, board work program, which is on page 29 of the agenda. Uh, Ms. Graham, will speak to any, will speak to the report. In, no, okay. Happy to again to take questions. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have one question around um, the, it's on page 37, around variation three. 
um, and the indication that the issue and options identification is next year. My question is, um, is there an opportunity after that issue's notification uh, to include issues that may have been missed? I mean, what, and I'm thinking specifically, I'll give, for example, would be <clears throat> the request we've had from uh, the live music community around noise installation. Is that, A, is that something that will be part of V3 or can be stitched in? I just, I, I'm As it happens, Mr. Freeland is here, and with the leave of the meeting, I'll oh, ask him per to answer this person. question. Um, thank you. Uh, the, the live music action um, matter is already partly to be addressed through Variation 3 and considered. Um, uh, we have a long a list of um, items for Variation 3, and the, the further we, the closer we get to notification, the less able we are to consider new items, but that's definitely something which has been addressed to a certain extent already. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have a couple of questions. On page 35, there's a Zero Carbon Alliance, and it says that all parties have signed, and I just wanted to check that Te Whato Order signed, because Health New Zealand was part yes. of it, so they've signed. So, And then my next question is around last time we had forward work programs for a lot of the committees, and as they're changing, will those forward work programs, um, will they come into council or will they go to, to new committees? Just to, just to follow up on some of the the actions in those. So the plan is um, once we've recast the delegations, we will then um, correspondingly recast the forward action items to match the right committees. And my next question is on page 37, just around the future development strategy. And in the last um, pre-election forward work program, it just said that there would be, the report would include the governance arrangements. And I'm just wondering if the report that's coming to the 13th of December also includes the governance arrangements. I've just asked that exact same oh, question good. in reviewing the report, so I don't know the answer yet. Awesome, thank you. Very good. Any further questions? Okay. <clears throat> in which case, I'll move that Council notes the updated ca Council Forward Work Program as shown in Attachment A. Mr. Seconder, Councillor Walker. All those in favour? Aye. Against? Thank you. The motion is carried. So now to item eight, which is a submission on the National Direction for Plantation and Exotic Carbon Afforestation, page 39 of the agenda. We have uh, Mr. Drew and Mr. Freeland, and perhaps uh, Ms. Katie James, no? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Katie James is unfortunately um, the principal writer of this report and also unwell today, so I shall do my best. I'm sure you'll do a wonderful job. Are you happy to take questions? Happy to take questions. Okay. Do we have any questions? Deputy Mayor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Just one question. Usually we have someone that might speak at these, and I notice this approves the submission, authorises the CEO to make minor editorial changes. Was there the opportunity for perhaps someone from Council to, to speak to the submission? Mr Mayor, uh, do you mean at the to the ministry that have undertaken this consultation? Yes, so like when, when we've done ones on Three Waters, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, one of the councillors um, would have spoken to it, so I just wondered if there was the opportunity, A, and B, whether that was considered when the um, submission was put together? So the, the consultation that was put out by the, the two ministries involved was um, a questionnaire and a consultation document um, they, they're not looking to have a hearing or hear um, oral submissions, so it's primarily a written submission that they requested. Councillor Gilbert. Um, thank you. <clears throat> I've got a question that I'm not sure quite how to, to word. Basically, it is around the, the concept of exotic plantings. Specifically, it is based on an assumption that exotic plantings are ostensibly pine. Would that be, a, first of all, would that be a fair assumption? Through the chair, um, a lot of the exotic plantings for um, forestry, uh, whether it be plantation forestry or permanent um, carbon forestry, are pines, but not exclusively. Okay. Um, with the risk of wilding pines that we've obviously seen in this country over the decades, um, and 
a more probably a, a more sh a more popular shift to planting natives has is there any ability to push back in terms of having more of a native planting p uh, into this or is it solely predominantly pine through the chair the the plantation forestry um, doesn't exclude native plantings um, what the what's been introduced here is carbon exotic forestry so that obviously does exclude native plantings um, so there's not necessarily an ability to push back here the other thing that I would note is uh, wilding pines is a matter which is part of the national environmental strategy national environmental standard for plantation forestry and they have a wilding pine calculator which uh, any new afforestation has to meet certain numbers to be allowed to proceed so it's clearly a matter which is front of mind for new forestry thank you do we have any further questions would someone like to put the motion so that they get to speak to it no uh, Councillor Walker. Happy move. Yep. We have a seconder for the motion. Councillor, seconded Councillor O'Malley. Uh, we're now in debate. Does anyone have a like statement they would like to make? I guess. Yes. The, the, <laughs> um, yeah, thanks. I'll be very brief. And thanks to staff for putting together this submission. Uh, it's very clear. Um, it's obviously. Um, stitching in the fact that the NESPF at the moment does not currently apply to permanent uh, exotic carbon forests. The submission uh, obviously talks about um, managing the, um, the predicted environmental effects of what's going to be increasing afforestation. Um, it's about regulatory controls on location of new afforestation. That's basically farms converting to, to forestry. It's quite rightly about um, controlling predicted increase in wildfire risk and it's obviously and importantly it's about managing the effects on landscape uh, particularly indigenous uh, biodiversity and I think this submission speaks to all of those very clearly and very well and thanks staff for doing that work. Do we have any further speakers? You can see the motion on the uh, page 39 of your agenda and also on the screen, slightly obscured by the timekeeper. The code of timekeeping app. Uh, and we'll just pull that down. Yes, there we go. So uh, that is the motion. We have a seconder. So I'll now put the motion. All those in favour, say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. So we'll move on to item number nine, a submission. A different submission on the future of St Andrew Street, page 52 of your agenda. Mr Drew and Ms Benson yes, is here. Perfect timing. My goodness. Impeccable. Uh, <coughs> And so, would you like to speak to the report? No, I'm happy to take it as read. Thank you. Very good. You're happy to take questions? I hope so. Yep. So, do we have any questions? Councillor Vandervis. On page, um, what have we got, 59 at the top of the page there, um, mm -hmm. item seven, it's, uh, sorry, number seven, it says, St Andrew Street is an important east-west connection for the city, I think arguably perhaps the most, with some of this function will need to remain on St Andrew Street. What is meant by some of this function, given that it is the main east-west route? So I think when we talk about some of the function, we're talking more about um, vehicle use rather than heavy vehicle use that should get shifted into the new State Highway 88. So given that heavy vehicles basically go <coughs> wherever the shortest run is for them, uh, how do you propose to maintain the east-west east -west, uh, connectivity for cars but exclude heavy vehicles? It's a very good question. Um, we do work quite heavily with the Heavy Haulage Association. I go to a meeting with them every two months down at NZTA where we try and encourage um, preferred heavy vehicle routes. So the NZTA proposal to I think the term is detune St Andrew Street, which 
sounds like a dreadful word for anyone that likes cars because we're always trying to tune them up. Um, but the detuning would involve what and a narrowing of the 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 lanes or um, I'd what's have to, what's actually proposed? I'd have to check on that, councillor. Potentially, yes, the narrowing of the streets and potentially there could be some, well there definitely is more access for cyclists and walkers on St Andrews Street under the new proposal, but I'd need to double check if there's any things like curb, you know, extrusions and stuff like that. Would, the, would these be the cyclists that currently seem not to use the one-way street system in droves? Um. Sorry, trick question, not fair. <laughs> um, uh, the, yeah. Uh, so, ha have we got uh, like a, 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 a diagram of what's proposed with curb protrusions and, and cycleways and things? Um, is that something that the public are going to have the opportunity to have uh, input into? There, there is no designs done yet. This is the first element of the business case where Wakakate is seeking feedback, and then they'll use that feedback to work out uh, uh, and incorporate that into the designs. So okay. there'll be an opportunity for feedback once the designs, once this feedback has been received, considered, some designs will be done and there'll be another opportunity for feedback after that. And, and assuming that the submission goes through and that the uh, heavy transport is going to be somehow diverted into Frederick Street, have you got any idea of what costs would be involved in redesigning those intersections, um, given that you've got a railway crossing at St Andrew Street? Um, has any thought been put into, uh, I think it was the Mayor's suggestion, of an overhead walkway uh, from the St Andrew Street car park to the hospital uh, that might facilitate um, a safer crossing while not compromising so much traffic? Yeah, so we're definitely not ruling out um, uh, connections to the city from that side of the city getting across the railway line. Um, at, at the moment, we only have um, we have connections at Plato's and across the railway line using the old yes. uh, rail overbridge. If you if you're strong enough to be able to lift your bike up onto that railing, um, so we're definitely not ruling out future connections. Um, I just might go back to um, <coughs> the feedback. One of the things that we have put in our submission is that we support very much. Um, having some kind of 3D modelling um, as part of the um, public feedback approach because I think a lot of people that look at a sort of a, a 2D, you know, relatively binary plan on a page can't quite envisage that. So we are working with Waka Katahi to make that a little bit more interactive for the public. And, and overhead pedestrian access is on the table as well? It's not ruled out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Thank you, um, and that that was that really resonated with me uh, because I'm visualising things is important. We've just had a um, we've just had a, um, public forum representation from the disability community around George Street, but but the same things would be relevant. I'm assuming uh, when we talk about in paragraph five <coughs> the Dunedin Hospital and the um, pedestrians that use that. Uh, that the needs of the disability community when we come to sort of the next stage of design and talking to Wakatahi, that will certainly be part of it. I'm sure they'll submit uh, as well. But uh, my question is, are we taking that into account as we have before? They did talk very positively about their engagement with council staff. Yes, yeah, so we um, we work quite closely with Mary and her team, um, not just on project work, but on um, regular renewals to make sure that the disability um, disability group are, are represented in terms of the work that we do. Wonderful, thank you, Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you, Miss Benson. Um, following up on what you talked about with three D modelling and traffic modelling and the note in the letter to Waka Katahi on point 14, or paragraph 14, even looking at the Waka Katahi information that they provided, it, it made it very difficult even for the community to understand what actually was taking place here. And even when I looked at the ODT archives and saw the letter, uh, saw the article they'd written uh, back on the 22nd of October, uh, it, 
again, it made it very visually challenging. Um, can you expand a little bit more about the 3D modelling and, and the importance of that for the city? Well, I think um, one of the things that I know with um, traffic modelling is for people to be able to see the impacts in a live situation, um, well, a, 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 not a live situation, but a, a modelled situation is really important. Um, and we're certainly working with NZTA to try and um, work that through. But I think I think the big thing for us was a lot of the Shaping Future to Need and Transport consultation was really, really popular amongst the public because it was quite interactive. Um, and we would want to work with the NZTA to make sure that that, was, that approach happens here because just on paper it is, it's very hard to comprehend. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of amazed that nowhere have I seen a picture um, in relation to this uh, showing what the hospital build would look like and the closed environment of the multi-storey buildings on either side um, and how that sort of shows what the street would look like. We've seen the hospital build, but not connecting it with with the street design in St Andrew Street. Yeah. So uh, as Simon said, that will um, that will come as part of the um, the more detailed design. Um, I think probably probably middle to to you know, September of next year, we should start seeing some detail coming out from Waka Kotahi on that. Thank you. That appears to have exhausted questions. I haven't. Oh, questions. Very good, <laughs> Councillor Bailey. I thought you were moving the motion. I think. Well, I do like. I want to move the motion too. Thank you, wish, you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just to clarify, this is not our consultation, correct? This is Waka Kotahi's. That's correct. Yeah. So we're submitting on a Waka Kotahi. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, and again, because I assume from that then that the primary designer of these road changes is Waka Kotahi. But, but we're interacting with them through Connect and Dunedin. Yes, uh, we are interacting them, uh, interacting with them through Connecting Dunedin, both at a communications level and at a design level. Um, so there's two levels that we do that, and also a governance level. And obviously, um, we have to be very aligned with them in terms of what happens to the the redesignated State Highway 88 and its connection to the Harbour Arterial. Yeah, I'm going to address that in the speeches. Um, when will the hospital build reach Hanover Street? Because it's in our it's in our submission that that the hospital rebuild would eventually get as far as Hanover Street. So we are looking at Frederick Street as the east west arterial. But do you have any idea? My feeling is it doesn't get up there till about 2040. Um, I don't know, Councillor. I can find that out. And then my last question um, gets to, I think there's 15,000 car movements on Portsmouth Drive. So assuming that split evenly, 7,500 car movements in the morning and then again in the afternoon. Currently a lot of that uses Thomas Burns Street, the big roundabout there, and then crosses at St Andrews Street. The de-turning of St Andrews Street, would that anticipate the 7,500 car movements are still going to go down St Andrews Street? Um, oh, I'd, I'd probably need to double check that, but I wouldn't assume that that would be the case, that there would be a split there. And if they, and old Wakakatahi data that was first put out for the hospital rebuild showed that most of the traffic coming from the south and the southeast during the morning commute is attempting to um, hit the centre of town. So if that traffic goes past St Andrew Street, it will have gone north to the destination and then presumably would have to turn around and come back if it still continues doing that, is that correct? That's um, actually just a logical question at this point. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. And I'm happy to move if you wish, Mr Mayor. Uh, do we have any further questions? Further question? No, uh, so uh, the motion has been moved by Councillor Malley and seconded by Councillor Wiley. Would you like to speak to the motion? Mm -hmm. Councillor Malley, please. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I think that I actually asked um, that the city submit on this. We could have just worked through connecting Dunedin or shaping Dunedin Future Transport 
but I had a feeling that the public itself may not be aware of exactly where this program is and how far it's gone, so I thought it was useful in the terms of good public communication for us to do a submission so that it would be caught as the submission and then that would get into the public um, forum in the public eye. I think when we look at this we have to look at what is the genesis of these changes and the genesis of this is the building of the new hospital. Um, and with that building of the, of the new hospital there has been a call for two things. Um, that St Andrew Street become a more um, pedestrian friendly area and also that Cumberland Street which is the one way north also become a more pedestrian friendly area and while it's not part of this consultation they, they do become interlinked as you look forward um, and I think that when we're looking at this the, this is State Highway 88 which is a heavy freight um, state highway but nevertheless on the St Andrew Street section of it also carries a large amount of um, light vehicle transport which is associated with commuters um, and then obviously State Highway 1. So we're trying to balance network efficiency against livability and that becomes a significant challenge in a city that's as spatially constrained as us and we bring the spatial constraint up in our, pro in our letter. Um, so this primarily often is the focus of the moving the heavy transport of State Highway 8A but I think we cannot forget that the light vehicles are also part of what's coming in. And there's really nothing controversial, I think, about terminating State Highway 8 from the port and going down Frederick Street. That probably doesn't change much in terms of the way that heavy transport would move. But um, it's important to remember that changing that termination point will have a major effect on the ability to St Andrew Street to work as an east-west east carrying road. And we've captured that in, um, in our in our submission and I really want to think, I want people to consider the effect on the vehicles that are originating from basically the Vauxhall area. So they could be coming out of um, uh, McAndrew Bay, uh, they could be coming out of the peninsula or they could be coming out of Annie Bay, Vauxhall in that area. They tend to go down Portsmouth Drive. If they're trying to get to the centre of town, it's a not a well serviced area for public transport. So until we can get those vehicles going somewhere else, they will be coming. Now, if we detune St Andrews, they are going to try to go north. And at the moment, the main problem that we face is that the only bridge over the railway line when you go north is the Wharf Street Bridge, which terminates on Frederick Street on the other side of the railway line, which was built probably in the 1940s and intended to carry smaller trucks than it's carrying now. We'll be moving very big vehicles over that bridge. And yet there's not much budget to do for that section of the harbour arterial. Now, the other thing we've got to keep in mind is that um, George Street, by changing the George Street design, we're moving traffic onto both either Great King or Falul. Great King is carrying buses, which means that it more likely will end up being Falul. And then cars on that um, will then, if they're trying to get back, would be trying to go west-east, and they'll have to use either Hanover or Frederick. I guess my bias is that they'll end up wanting to use Hanover over Frederick. Now, the problem is when they get down to the end of Hanover, they're on Anzac Ave and there's no bridge over the railway line there. So they're going to go left and then they're going to go up over that bridge and inter inter interface with all of that heavy traffic that we're trying to push on State Highway 88 and the Harbour Arterial. I don't think that bridge is capable of taking what's coming towards it. And effectively, we don't have any options because the bottom line with this is that we're underfunded. Um, this is a once in a generation opportunity to look at the way traffic moves around in the city where we are going to balance the difference between network efficiency and livability. If we don't do this right, we'll I'll probably achieve neither, which is really the worst outcome that we could look for. So my feedback is if we are to downgrade, detune St Andrews Street, then we need substantially more money from Waka Kotahi put into what is called Section 4 of the Harbour Arterial. And in fact, regardless of what we do on State Highway 1, we need that work done on the Harbour Arterial because of what we've done on George Street. So we need the work, we need, but we need the money to do it. And this is primarily a, a Waka Katahi project of which we are supporting. So I am basically saying with the submission, the section where we say it's underfunded, I'm personally emphasising that section as saying we are actually very much underfunded. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, does anyone have a comment to make? Councillor Wiley. I think um, 
Councillor O'Malley summed it up very nicely. And I think the bottom line, as I've seen this consultation uh, process start, is that, again, we're consulting on, uh, well, we're submitting on something that's in isolation from Waka Katahi. At some point, we have to bring all the Waka Katahi projects together around the city, and that's pretty much what Councillor malley has been alluding to with some of the data. When we're doing, trying to submit and work in isolation on these projects, we are going to end up with poor results. We have to take a far holistic approach and look at how we are going to move around the city in its entirety. And I get really frustrated trying to read these maps and actually when we look at the information provided to us and to the community about what this area is supposed to look like when the work is done. For example, for Waka Katahi to produce this information and not have a picture of the hospital build as it's proposed to be finished, I think is extremely disappointing and disingenuous to the community. They have no idea when they're trying to read this information from the agency on what they are actually talking about or what they are supposed to be submitting on. Let's get all the information out on the table and let's challenge Waka Katahi to actually in, and really spend money and tell the full story of what they intend or project and how the community and council and others can truly engage. But when I see this piecemeal and divide and conquer mentality that I'm currently envisaging is taking place, I'm getting very concerned about what our, our whole city will look like in the next 10 to 20 years. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gary. Thank you. Uh, I want to start by thanking staff for the considerable work uh, and also the Chair of Infrastructure Services for the work that's gone into this report and also the submission. Um, I'm a person who's very visual. I need to see something to understand it. And my first response was similar to Councillor Wiley's that uh, I wanted to see a picture. I wanted to understand what this actually meant for me uh, moving around the city and for others moving around the city. So I was very heartened to hear Ms Benson um, mention the idea of 3D modelling. I think that has real merit and would assist uh, all of us, including the wider community, in understanding what is uh, what they are thinking of, what they are proposing. Um, at the heart of this is is making St Andrew Street a more pedestrian friendly uh, area. And and the one thing that isn't covered in here is is the the uh, idea of picking up and dropping off, which is very much going to be part of that space. And it's always safer to do that uh, when you don't have huge trucks roaring past. Uh, and we've heard from the disability community this morning that safety is a key feature. Um, and I certainly know uh, when I'm attending uh, appointments at the hospital, like many people in the community, if you have somebody with uh, mobility issues uh, that you're supporting, it takes a little more time uh, and you certainly feel a whole lot more unsafe if you've got large volumes of traffic roaring past. Um, I note the mention of livability outcomes uh, as being extremely important in this. Uh, and uh, Councillor O'Malley talked about um, the worry that we won't achieve both the traffic movement, keeping the traffic moving, and livability. Uh, I'm thinking about it in a different way uh, and believing that we can achieve both, uh, but we need to keep our vision very clear. Um, we need to encourage Hokkatahi to engage in a way that's meaningful with our, for our community. We need to continue to advocate strongly and particularly on the matter of resourcing because that is key to us being able to achieve what needs to happen here. Um, and as we heard this morning, it's about the whole package, not just one element of it. Um, so keep up the great work, uh, staff and uh, chair of the Infrastructure Services Committee, uh, and I fully support this submission. Thank you. Councillor Vandervis. I'd like to echo Councillor Wiley's view that we really need a holistic approach and look at the whole of the central city in, in this 
the uh, other suggestions that have been made about having a 3D rather than a 2D approach, um, I also concur with. Um, and to that end, I think that uh, we should break away from this idea that all traffic, pedestrian, uh, cycle and car and truck should all be at ground level. There is, if you look at a lot of other cities where there is a space constraint, regularly overhead walkways which guarantee a constant and easy uh, passage of, and entirely safe passage of pedestrians over and above uh, necessary um, vehicle uh, arterials. And to me, uh, St Andrew Street and the St Andrew Street rail crossing and the weight that they can carry, as Councillor O'Malley has pointed out, are very necessary parts of these arterials. Um, Councillor O'Malley has also said that the, the genesis is, is the building of the new hospital, and, and I agree with that. Um, however, um, uh, I have a fairly cynical view that the uh, siting of the hospital was largely to essentially detune traffic from the whole of the centre city and to try and, and I think um, Mayor Cull's words, turn all of the centre city into one big uh, pedestrian mall. Uh, I don't believe that this is appropriate for the city. I think that if we get the vehicles out of the city uh, and we detune the rest of the centre as we have detuned the farmers block already, that this will see the demise actually of the centre city and I realise that it's a, perhaps a minority view around the table but I would suggest that it's a majority view if you uh, talk to the people that actually want to use the city and look at what um, modes of transport they use and how unwilling they have been to change that mode of transport despite significant changes for instance the, to, to the buses. So. Um, in terms of this particular submission, uh, I'm concerned that uh, the suppose that the, the proposal is that um, St Andrew Street is recognised as an important east-west connection, and that some of this function will need to remain. I believe that all of the function of St Andrew Street needs to remain. Um, I don't think that we can actually divert it. Um, and Councillor O'Malley has uh, referred to some of the difficulties and the significant extra cost that would be required to divert it. I don't even think that it's actually in the city's interests to divert it. This obsession with uh, health and safety, the primacy of the 2015 Health and Safety Act, uh, I think has led to a lot of very, very poor outcomes in terms of uh, economics, in terms of um, uh, easy traffic movement. And if we are to detune St Andrew Street as we are detuning George Street currently, uh, this detuning, I think, is basically just going to be a, an arterial sclerosis for the middle of our city, and we will see the hollowing out of the city over uh, years if this uh, process is allowed to continue. I do appreciate that this submission is an attempt to try and um, somehow uh, uh, make a positive spin on, on what is proposed, but um, I don't see it as, as being workable. Um, uh, Councillor O'Malley says we need to do this right. I think what we really need to do is accept that we need to go up in terms of uh, pedestrian safety rather than get vehicles out. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'd like to uh, compliment Mr O'Malley and the infrastructure team uh, for this submission because I, I particularly like the way it's concise and clear and in plain English. And to me it's covered off a couple of very important considerations. Firstly, that St Andrew Street is an important east-west connection and some of the function needs to remain. Um, I think it, some of the function is an appropriate term rather than all of the function because some of the heavy traffic will be diverted, uh, well a large part of the heavy traffic will be diverted to go down to Frederick Street uh, as we uh, instigate that harbour arterial project, finish off that harbour arterial project. But it's also very important clause 10 that transport funding presently allocated to support 
Uh, the new Dunedin Hospital and indeed all of the transport network of Dunedin is not enough. And I personally have spoken to um, Mr Cagle about this and um, mentioned that specifically to him. So it's very good to have that reinforced here. And I think uh, we will always want to have a level crossing across the railway because getting rid of that level crossing at St Andrew Street could put us in jeopardy. So in terms of transport links, if um, you know an earthquake were to take out both the overhead bridges, for instance, as we had talked about that recently, uh, which I think is unlikely to happen. However, it is always good to have a level crossing if someone wants to move a house through Dunedin and they can have a wide transit across that level crossing. So there's a range of reasons and all manner of traffic that would still want, needs to be, needs to have a flat crossing across that railway. So, but it's all covered in this letter and it's very concise, thank you very much. So if we have no further speakers, I'll ask if, uh, Mr Malley for his right of a Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I start with Councillor Gary's speech. Um, I think the aspiration of St Andrew Street to become um, what the hospital design um, is looking for and what the councillor basically outlined in her speech is, is clearly is a desirable outcome that we need in there. And I just want to clarify, I actually said that I don't think either will be able to be reached at the current um, design and in fact I would like to see both. So the issue really is I think is resources. Um, I think once it's properly resourced it will be able to give us the outcome that we're looking for. Um, to Councillor Vanderbus, I think you have touched on something when you talk about the elevated pedestrian platform. I'm not that enthusiastic about elevated pedestrian platforms because they had their own accessibility issues and their own visual impact. But we are definitely, and maybe if we just take the argument at this point, spatially constrained as we're trying to put a number of modalities into the same spatial spot. So I'm, my desire is to push State Highway 1 down when we get to the State Highway 1 debate. But, but nevertheless, I think we are de dealing with the fact that it's the challenge that we face with Dunedin and any city of this size with this spatial constraint is that it's hard to put everything in the same spot. And when you're trying for these good livability and social outcomes, they do not come cheaply because of your spatial constraints. Um, to, to your worship, um, oh, I, sorry, I still, to Mr. Mayor, six years of bad habits. Um, um, it's not just the heavy traffic we've got to consider, it is the light traffic and, and it is the issue of whether or not the crossing at St Andrews Street would actually remain or not, or whether in fact it's targeted and, and in the design that light traffic will be crossing there. It seems incompatible to me that if you are trying to achieve the drop off and pick up stuff and the, and, the, and the pedestrian work that you're trying to get done in that block of St Andrews that you would be able to sustain 7,500 car movements through it during the rush hour. So it would be an incompatible activity um, which makes me think that the design is not going to allow it to go there if we're trying to get this other outcome. And that's why I'm saying it, it, that traffic is very likely to be pushed at least one block further north and there is no good crossing of the railway line proposed in the current budget. So though that's, and that's an obvious budget constraint right there. If I had another 45 minutes, I'd go through all of them. Um, but I don't think there's a need. Um, and I just want to finish by thanking staff for somewhat indulging me for putting this up as a council item. Um, but I think it was worth the, it was worth the effort. Thank you. Very good. I'd now like to um, uh, put the motion. So, all those in favour, say aye. aye. Against? No. Thank you. Uh, and at this point uh, in the piece, we're right on 12 o'clock and lunch will have arrived. So I'd like to move that we adjourn for lunch for three quarters of an hour till quarter to one. Seconded uh, Councillor Mayhem. All those in favour? Aye. Anyone against?
come to order. And so uh, I have an apology for the uh, next part of the meeting from Councillor Wiley. I move that we accept that apology. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Houlihan. All those in favour? Oh, no. no one against? No. Thank you. Uh, so we're on to the next item on the agenda, item 10, the financial result. So um, Ms Ellen will come to the table. And Ms Graham is here to speak to the report. Are you happy to take questions? We are. Do you have any, any comment to the report? No? No, we're happy to take questions. Questions, councillors? Okay. Thinking, thinking, thinking. I uh, will ask one. <laughs> um, on page 63, our increase in capex, is it driven at all by decreased pro private spending, thus increasing the availability of contractors? No, I don't think so. I, th I think this reflects that we are in a delivery phase in our procurement, but also that we are now experiencing some cross cost pressures. Yes. And so further to that, when we look over to page 67, and we've got the summary by activity, um, obviously the big expenditure in transport and three waters, and there is a commentary that there's a few uh, subsidies yet to come, how much will the overspend be offset by the um, expected government grants and subsidies? We don't know that with any level of detail at this point. But remember, this is a four-month position, mm. um, and so I would expect things to even out um, as we near year end. Great. Thank you. And uh, for interest's sake, I'll just comment that uh, other councils have said that, that about seven million of some government grants fund they haven't got either. Anyway, uh, up further questions? Councillor Um I, I just thought I'd pose this question but also say that I've had it answered by the Chief Executive, but just to let everybody know, on the first graph there on page 63, uh, the operating deficit is a good chunk uh, la, um, worse than the, than the um, uh, budget. And the answer for that is on page 72, where it talks about the increased depreciation on reticulation assets within three waters. So a significant uh, 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 increase in the uh, depreciation, um, almost sort of six million there, accounts for that considerably worsening op operating deficit. Uh, Councillor Gary. Uh, just a couple of details, and I'm not sure if either of you will be able to answer this. Page 70. Just remind me, the Curry Street fire? It was a social housing unit in Port oh, Chalmers. OK, thank you. And the other one was around the... Do, do we have any understanding of that increase in volume of waste? I mean, while it's positive in terms of revenue, it's not good for other reasons. Do we have any kind of understanding of that at all? Possibly Chris Henderson, that would be... I'm sorry, to and Mr that. Drew's not here, but I, no. I will um, okay. ask and see if Thank there's you. a reason. Thank you very much. Cheers. Councillor Malley. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, it's probably a question of CEO. It's, um, supply chain inflation is hitting everything, and um, I'm just wondering, I should know the answer to this, but I don't. When does the Waka Katahi um, far rate kick in? Is it at the end of the project, or is it at the start of a project? So in other words, are we, are we exposed in, universally to the inflation or does the, is Wakatai also exposed to it? Um, we would both be. So it comes in at the so end of the project? So it comes in as the monthly. Oh, okay, so we, we, we submit what was spent and then they do the, okay, so, yes. so we're both exposed. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Yeah, thank you. A uh, question around page 72 and the depreciation figure that's obviously gone up because of that revaluation to 1.3 billion of the water assets. Just a question around the, I think it mentions it's subject to some audit review. Is where we, could you just expand on that a wee bit? It's ongoing. It's just ongoing and no, no 
no known timeline when we'll know? No, we, we're working through that process with the auditor at the minute. Okay, thanks. Uh, questions, do I have a mover? Okay, I'm happy to move. <laughs> do I have a seconder? Councillor Malley. Uh, so, uh, we're now in debate. I, um, speaking to this motion, uh, well, there's a double-edged sword, of course, because we're spending more money uh, and catching up on delayed infrastructure improvements. So we've done a very good job. I think the, the team are to be complimented on the job that uh, they have done in um, arranging contractors and contracts and getting a smooth workflow out there because for a very long time we seem to be hampered by the lack of contractors and ability to get things done. Uh, but that has certainly turned around and uh, to me it appears as though that has come, that has been driven uh, completely by the DCC staff and the, org the organisation of the twin uh, contract contractor system and the way that contracts have been organised. I also I believe there, there has been efficiencies in how things have been done so that people are actually getting more done for the money, uh, despite the fact that we're well up. And of course there is now correspondingly, uh, as the value of the asset increases um, quite markedly, then the amount of depreciation requires also, required also increases. So, um, it has a well a detrimental effect on the uh, on the balance sheet. However, it's getting a lot more done, so we're getting ahead on things. So I think uh, the team are to be complimented for making a lot of stuff happen. Well done, Councillor Melly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want a basic comment that up till recently, our underspend on capital was our under delivery, and it's good to see us getting the delivery online. But as my question foreshadowed, I think that we're going to start seeing in the future, in a not too distant future, like every other council, we're going to be affected by um, what effectively is supply chain inflammation, uh, in, inflation. Leaves me a bit inflamed afterwards. Um, um, and I think that that's going to start affecting our ability to deliver in the future. Thank you. Any other comments? No, if we have no further comments, I have uh, nothing more to say. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Okay, so moving right along to the next item on agenda, number 11. This is the Waipori Fund for the quarter ending September 22. Mr Richard Davey, would you like to speak to the report, Mr Davey? Um, yes, I would. Um, the fund had a small positive quarter um, and it was really a consolidation on the quarter to the end of June where it was negative 3.3 versus benchmark of negative 4.6 so it had a positive gain of plus 0.5%. Um, one thing to note is despite the stable quarter um, the inflation adjusted capital base uh, is being effective, affected relative to the value of the fund, given that inflation is travelling at about 7% versus quite um, a stable performance for the fund. Very good. Are you happy to take questions? Councillor Walker. Thank you, Ms Mayor. Thank you for the report, Mr Davey. Um, it, it's interesting. I mean, the fast-moving markets, even your report, the OCR you had, uh, 3.5 is already 75 point basis points above that, and the predicted um, five peak. But is it right that that peak now is being predicted more five and a half to six? Uh, yes, it is. Five and a half is the Reserve Bank's official forecast. Um, ANZ is forecasting a peak of 5.75. Um, there are a few banks who are starting to question about how far the cash rate will go, given what's on the other side of, of uh, those increases. Okay. And we should all be assured as ever that, and be aware of the fact this fund has always been positioned as a long-term investment. Yes, very much so, and it's continued to show good returns over the long term. Councillor Gary. Thank you. Um, Mr Davey, the international equities 
Uh, would you have any comment to make about the ongoing war in Ukraine and that volatility in that part of the world and the impact on that part of our investments? Yeah, as far as international equities have been very volatile um, and um, the war in Ukraine is impacting things and has impacted things and will continue to do so going forward. Um, one thing we do see is with equity market volatility, when equities come off, the New Zealand dollar typically loses value as well, which acts as a good hedge for the um, international equities component of the fund. Thank you. Councillor Walker. I guess it's a corollary question and follow-up to, to, to Councillor Gary's. Um, things like the war in Ukraine and the pressure on equity markets in some way also offers an opportunity to buy shares for the longer-term investment, which is the modus operandi of this fund. I uh, used that right. It, it, it certainly does. And also with interest rates increasing as well too, um, the fund has positioned more money in longer-term fixed interest uh, out of short-term fixed interest with higher long-term yields. Okay, if we're questioning out, would someone like to move? Can we accept the report? Councillor Vandivis, second it. Councillor Gary? Councillor Vandivis. I'm happy to move this report, um, despite the fact that our blue line is uh, shrinking a bit at the moment. The, um, I think it's fairly well covered in the report, uh, the reasons for that, and particularly inflation. And I think we can look forward to uh, inflation being an ongoing issue, uh, at least for next year from what I understand. Uh, I'm very happy that this fund has been well managed, that it has a long-term view in its policy, and that um, we are really only taking dividends from it that are in excess of the index-linked value of the fund. And as such, uh, I feel very comfortable with it and, and happy to recommend everyone vote for it. Uh, for, vote for noting this quarterly report. Thank you. Any further speakers? Councillor Gary. I just want to acknowledge the uh, staff's work in this area. And I certainly have confidence uh, as we get our quarterly reports that it is well managed and it has a long-term view. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that. Thank you. No further speakers. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Against? Thank you. And thank you, Mr Davey. That's very good. Moving right along to item number 12 on the agenda, the meeting schedule for 2023, shown on page 81 of your agenda. We have a mover. Do we have a second, Dick? Yeah. Councillor Mayhem. Right. Uh, do we have any questions of Ms Graham? I, I just have a quick comment. Um, a comment. We've had a request um, when councillors have reviewed this to switch a couple of dates um, to accommodate availability um, for the committee meetings. That'll be the Economic Development Committee in March. Yes, and the committee. We're going to swap the two. We're going to swap those two days around. So. Oh, just yeah, just to, just to swap to a, a, accommodate um, the chair's availability. That's the only change. Right. Councillor Walker. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for this. Um, I just do have a question around, um, and it's probably I don't know. Speaking on behalf of other people who have various work pressures, but having the workshops the day before the council meetings um, is a day that s some of us do allocate as a, a whole reading day. And I know there's probably good reason in there to have those prior to the council meetings, but I just wanted to note that that can put pressure on on people who have particularly have families. I would say that what we're trying to do is provide certainty, and Monday, Tuesday is kind of the... Um the, the cycle, um, that, that's why we've done it that way. They are op holding spaces that may may or may not be filled, but just so councillors are aware. Councillor Hulane. Uh, does that mean we could get our papers a day earlier then if we lose a day for reading? You, councillors, we get the agendas to you as soon as we can. We are trying to get them to you two days earlier than the statutory deadline, but managing the reading is for you to do. Do we have any further questions? No. In which case, um, do I have a move? who moved the motion? Oh, yes. So, um, 
your right to speak, please. Oh, just just happy to move it with the amended uh, swapping of Monday, Tuesday for March, and, and I think April. I think we've already had a seconder, so uh, this is a move into debate. Does anyone got anything further to say about the matter? No? Great. Okay, so I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? No. Thank you. Um, that is the end of the meeting public. One more? Oh, 13, yes, golly. Over the page. Here we go. Uh, this is almost the item of the meeting public. This is item 13, the last of. And so, uh, interim delegations, the hearing committee. Uh, Ms Graham, would you like to speak to the report? This is just remedying um, an oversight in the interim delegations report that came to Council on the 8th. Uh, any questions? No. In which case, I'll put the motion. Do we have a seconder? Great. Councillor O'Malley, does anyone... Sorry? Uh, Councillor O'Malley. Very good. Uh, so, does any... I don't want to speak to the motion. Does anyone else have anything to speak, anything to say about the motion? Yes, I do. I just uh, want to acknowledge uh, Councillor Benson Pope's uh, massive, <clears throat> massive amount of work and contribution to the appeals uh, process in the last triennium and the mediations uh, in arriving at um, a, go a good position for Council. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that work and would like that noted. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Uh, now we're going down that line. Yeah, I just want to also put on record um, thanks to uh, Councillor Benson Pope for his gargantuan effort um, in, in, in completing this Herculean task, and I wish uh, the next chair all Godspeed and good luck. Thank you. Any further comments? No. All right, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? No. Uh, against? Carried. There endeth. The meeting public. I now uh, move that uh, we move uh, pursuant to the provisions of the Local Government Information and Meetings Act. 19